Good to see everyone, and I hope that you had a great Easter. Isn't it great to celebrate Jesus rising from the dead? I'm sure that uh, all our hearts are lifted after last Sunday and, and uh, just thinking on that. And it's, it's just great to see you all, right? And uh, it's amazing that we not only get to come and, you know, visit your, ch- your church sometimes, but that we've gotten to serve the Lord together in various ways and, you know, uh, into the future looking forward to uh, serving with you in other ways. And we're always blessed. We always leave ECF, the whole family, just blessed uh, by the music, by getting to break bread with you and uh, to uh, look into God's Word together. Uh, so it's, it's really good to be with you. I uh, ask you to pray as well. Uh, just something, uh, Faith on Fire, we're trying to do two five-a-side um, football tournaments in the summer, uh, one in Wicklow Town and one in Enniscorthy. And we're looking forward to linking in with the church here as we do the one in Enniscorthy, um, particularly for any young people that come um, and are interested and want to hear more about the Lord. We want to link them in here um, at ECF. So please pray. Uh, the other one we're doing in Wicklow Town. And just pray that God would use those outreaches to reach young people. Um, I've been a part of a similar outreach uh, a couple of years in the past. And I'm always, I always pinch myself when you see all those. It's usually guys. I, we, we really have not had a lot of girls come, although we never said girls couldn't come. But the guys come out for the football, you know. And I always pinch myself when you see them sitting, listening to the gospel, and you think, some of these guys are popular guys in their school. They're together guys. But they love football, so they come to this outreach, and we get to preach the gospel to them. And they get to hear how somebody came to Christ, somebody's personal story. And uh, so just pray that God would use uh, those outreaches over the summer. Well, uh, if you've got a Bible, let's turn to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at verse 1 through 12 of Luke chapter 10 together this morning. I love this passage and I've studied it many times and yet it always seems to yield new insights. Um, It's just a very powerful passage and story. But here we're in uh, Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 1 through 12. We're not going to delve, obviously into every detail of these verses. But we want to uh, get a working understanding of what's going on here in this passage, and then we want to draw some conclusions that are very practical uh, for our everyday life. Okay, So I'm going to just start by reading the whole passage for you, and then we will look at it together. Uh, Verse 1, it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Kind of a strange thing to say, don't greet anyone. When you enter a house, verse 5, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal those who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town We wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Kind of ominous words there at the end. But as Jesus was on earth, he had a very short time really to accomplish a loss. Okay, And Jesus recognized that he was going to have to deputize, if you like, or train others to do the work of preaching the gospel, preaching the message of Jesus, that he could never be himself in all these places at the same time. Okay, So, uh, in chapter 9 of the book of Luke, he sends out his 12 disciples, and it's it's a very similar passage. He sends them out. It's a lot of the same things. You know, don't bring, 
you know, a bag or money or a, a, an extra pair of sandals. He, he sends the twelve out. He says, I want you to go and preach the gospel. And if people welcome you, um, I want you to stay there and help them to understand the message of Jesus. But here in chapter 10, he sends out 72 other disciples. These are not the twelve. But these are just followers of Jesus that Jesus sends out. And here was the idea. Really, they were to go to all the towns they could get to, perhaps in a time frame, because they come back together. We see uh, later in the passage, uh, they come back together and they're really excited because of what they have seen God do. Okay, But they all, were all to go to as many towns as they could in this time period, and they were to do two things. We see in the, in the passage here, um, they were to heal those that were ill or sick, and they were to say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Okay, They were to give the, the, uh, uh, the good news about Jesus. And that was what they were to do. Um, and the idea simply was this, that they were to go to these towns before Jesus would eventually come himself, and they were to introduce them to the message of Jesus. And really they were trying to find who is open. What towns are open to Jesus coming? Um, what uh, families, what individuals in these communities are open? Because they wanted to uh, begin to give them the gospel. You know, it takes an average, and you, often it takes more. <laughs> but it takes an average of seven times for a person hearing the good news. Seven different times before they are ready to make a decision to follow Jesus. Um, and and that's, that, I think usually it's more. I think uh, we, we probably would all agree on that. It, it usually is more, but uh, missiologists, that's a big word for people that study how people respond to the gospel and all of that. Um, they, they have said that it takes an average of seven times. And so these 72 uh, disciples, they were to go and to give the good news so that when Jesus came, that was not the first time they'd heard this message. Okay? Now, I love what he says in verse 2, and and really, I want to spend the most time on this verse. We'll look at it a little more in depth at the end as we try to draw some conclusions from the story. But as they go out, Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And really, as you look at the rest of the passage, he's talking about a harvest of people that will welcome Jesus into their lives. Okay, That's what it's talking about. People that will welcome the message of Christ. The gospel of peace. The good news of peace. And Jesus made an amazing statement. He said, the harvest is plentiful. He said, there are people that would respond to the message of Jesus. But what does he say? But the workers are few. And you think of that. He, he's, sending, he's just sent out his 12 disciples. And they are, presumably have come back from their similar mission to go out and preach the gospel in various towns. He's now sending out 72 others. But Jesus is still hungry for more workers. He says there are more people that would respond to the message of Jesus if they had a chance. Then we have workers, you know. And it really is true in any age. I think this is a universal principle. There is a harvest of people that will respond to the message of Jesus if there are just workers to bring that message to them. Okay, so what's the response? Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, you almost think Jesus is next going to say, okay, so go to those 70. But he says, no, I want you to go, but I also want you to pray for more workers. You know, it it, it would be amazing uh, maybe in heaven to be able to go back and look at what were the results of that mission of those 72 going out. And you probably find there were people who were open. They were people of peace, uh, like we see uh, there in uh, verse 6. People who promote peace, that welcomed the gospel. God transformed their lives and they became workers that shared the good news with other people. And that's the dynamic of multiplication. Um, But Jesus says to them, he says, go and pray as you go that God would send out workers into his harvest field. Now, Jesus has some strange things to say in verse 3 and 4. First, he says, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. 
you know, we live in the country. We, we moved to a place called Tinnahili County Wicklow in December. And we're right out in the country. And right now there are lambs everywhere out in the fields, okay? And they're so cute, you know. And uh, I wouldn't fancy cleaning up after them, okay? Uh, but <laughs> they're very cute, you know. And you see them jumping around in the fields. Now, sheep are not the most intelligent animals around, okay? I think we, we could all agree on that, okay? Um, she, and sheep are very easily frightened, okay? Um, they're not very good at fighting to defend themselves, okay? Sheep just run away if there's a threat, okay? Uh, they're very uh, nervous animals. Sheep are very nervous animals. Now, a lamb, imagine how defenseless on a scale of all the animals that God created, a lamb is. It's like really <laughs> defenseless. Like, you know, it's not only a sheep, which is nervous and maybe not the smartest animal, and, uh, but it's, it's a baby sheep, okay? And it's very defenseless. And Jesus says a very strange thing. He says, I'm sending you out like lambs into the middle of a pack of wolves, okay? Into the middle of a pack of wolves. It's a very strange thing to say if you think about it. And we will unpack it a little bit more. But the basic idea he's saying is, this is going to be dangerous. And uh, in a sense, you are in danger. You are at a disadvantage, you know, as you go out to do this mission. And I think the idea is that they need to depend on the Lord and his power and his plan as they go forward. So he says also to them, and this is, this is um, important to understand. He says, do not take a purse or bag, or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. First of all, notice the three things that they are not to take, okay? If you were to go on a trip for a few weeks, you'd bring a suitcase. Maybe some of the ladies in the audience would bring three or four suitcases, right? (laughs) Um, I'm always amazed how much luggage some people need, you know, to go on holidays, you know? Some people just... Uh, you know, my dad used to always say, you know, I, I just need some underwear and a toothbrush. That's all I need, you know. That was my dad, you know. But some people, it's more, you know. But you'd at least bring something, wouldn't you? You'd at least bring a few changes of clothes. You'd bring, you know, uh, your toothbrush, you know, who knows, whatever you need. But you would bring a little bag. Jesus says, I don't want you to bring a bag. Just go the way you are. He said, I don't even want you to bring any money. He says, I don't want you to bring a spare pair of sandals. I want you to just go as you are. And it's kind of mystifying. It'll become clear as we look at um, verse 5 through 12 why he told them that. Okay, But he said to them, I don't want you to bring, I don't want you to prepare, you know, to take care of yourselves. I'm going to take care of you as you travel. Okay, is is what he's telling them. But then it says, uh, and do not greet anyone on the road. Now that seems, seems really rude, doesn't it? So can you imagine, they're, they're supposed to go out and witness to people, and they're just supposed to walk along the road, they're not supposed to say hello to anyone. Well, it helps to understand, this is in Eastern culture, okay? And the greetings of the day weren't just, how are you, you know? The greetings of the day were a very long, formal, elaborate affair, and it took ages, okay? So if you were to greet people on the road as you went, it would take you much longer to get to your destination, okay? Um, and so, literally, there were cases where somebody was on urgent business and they would not greet people because it was such a long process, okay? Uh, if somebody was a messenger, they were going with a message. They didn't stop to greet people because it was so, it took so long. And Jesus, that was his implication. You are on an important mission. I don't want you stopping and greeting people as you're traveling to the town. You need to get there quickly. And you are on urgent business. You don't have time to stop. Uh, you need to, to go. Now, obviously, uh, they were to minister to individuals in homes. They were to minister to these towns. But Jesus said there's an urgency about what you're going to do. Now, why did Jesus tell them not to bring any provisions? Well, here's why. In in verse 5 through 7, Jesus talks to them about how they're to deal with individuals, I believe families. Okay, He talks about when you come to a house, he's talking about families and individuals. And then he talks in verse 8 through 12 about when you come to a city, how do you interact with that city, okay? And notice what it says in verse 5 through 7. He says, when you enter into a house, you say, peace to this house. And that was 
an Eastern custom, but of course it was much more meaningful um, for uh, as the, these followers of Jesus came into this house because they were talking about peace with God. They were talking about responding to good, the good news of Jesus. Okay, But he said, if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. I've always wondered what that term means, a person who promotes peace. Okay, And I studied it a little bit to try to understand what it means. And really, the idea is somebody who welcomes the message of peace about Jesus. Okay? And a lot of time, and what we see is uh, both the, the homes and individuals and the cities, they showed that acceptance by hospitality. Okay? They would take care of these guests because they realized that the message they brought was of value and they wanted to take care of that person. Okay? Was the idea. And so, a person of peace. Um, one translation says, if anyone is there who shares in peace. One commentator said, a, a, a person of peace is someone who is inwardly prepared to accept your message of peace. So, and I, I, it's an amazing concept. But these 72 witnesses, they were looking for people who were open. They were, they were going to focus on these people who were, um, as it says here in our passage, uh, they were people who promote peace. They were people who welcomed that message of peace um, in their lives. And uh, so, they were to look for them. And they said, look, if, if they don't welcome you, your peace will return to you. If there's a person of peace there, your peace will rest on that home. And if not, your peace will return uh, to you. And in verse 7, that they were to stay there eating and drinking whatever they gave. Uh, for the worker deserves his wages. But notice, it wasn't just that Jesus had intentionally sent them out without provision so that as they went, and particularly, I think, in Eastern culture, as they went, they would be able to identify towns and families that were open to the gospel because these people would welcome them rather than saying, on your bike, you know, go on to the next town. We don't want to know about this Jesus, you know. Um, They would welcome them. And so, uh, Jesus had sent them out kind of at a disadvantage so that they would need to be taken care of and that would help them to see um, who were the people who were open. And it was sim- the, Jesus' instructions uh, in regard to towns is similar. He says, when you enter into a town and they welcome you, eat what is offered to you. Okay? Uh, let them take care of you. And it's, verse 9 is very powerful. I'm going to just stop here for a second on verse 9. This is what they were to do in cities or geographical locations or also in these homes that they would be in. Verse 9, Heal those who are ill and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. Two things, okay? Notice, first of all, they were to heal people. They were given power to cast out demons and to heal people um, as they went on this mission. And in fact, they were amazed when they came back because they did see God do some amazing things. They were able to cast out demons uh, just as they had seen Jesus do. Okay, And they did some amazing things. But I want to just draw attention to two things about that aspect of what they were to do. First of all, health care was a huge need in their day. Now, health care is still a need in our day. But they had even less options if they were sick. So this was a need everybody felt. There were many diseases and sicknesses there was no cure for. Uh, In fact, some diseases and sicknesses, if you went to a doctor, he might end up making you worse than better. And so when Jesus and then his disciples stepped into people's lives and they healed people, it met a need that they felt. Jesus had just made a difference in their practical lives, in a way that they felt it was real. Okay? And that's a a lesson to us in that as we go and preach the gospel, we need to not just simply give people the good news. That's what they ultimately need. But we need to be willing to help them with the practical needs in their lives. You know, I was thinking about it in our world. You know, one of the things, two things that come to mind, and we could make lists and lists of 
needs that our culture has. One is addiction. Addiction. So many people struggling in addiction in our society. You know, it's, it's amazing. You know, I've just moved to a tiny town. I used to always think, well, you know, drugs is a big city problem. Drugs is everywhere. There are young people and old people, people of all ages struggling with drug addiction all over this country, you know. And, you know, very often as a person who's in addiction, they really, they feel hopeless. The people around them feel hopeless. And, you know, it is an amazing thing to see God at work in a person who is in addiction in their lives and to see someone set free from addiction. It's often not instant. It often takes some love. And, uh, you know, I think of my friend Leighton Kelly. Uh, Leighton Kelly is the director of New Hope Residential Center in Dublin. It's a Christian drug rehab. And uh, I'm just amazed at Leighton. He faced addiction himself in his teen years, you know. And he was in the grip of heroin addiction. And God has transformed Leighton's life. And he's now helping people in addiction. He runs a residential center. And it's amazing to see. But, you know... um, We saw firsthand in our club the power of just one person recovering from addiction. What a testimony that is to Christ. And you know, God can do that. God can work in people's lives. God can turn people's lives around and meet the practical needs of their life. And I believe it's something we can pray for. You know, I wish that I, like these 72, had the power to go out and cast out demons and heal people. I don't believe I have that power. I don't believe God gives that power to individuals in our time. But you know, God can turn people's lives around. He can heal people. He can do life-changing works in people's lives. And that is something that we should pray for. Um, And we should uh, allow God to do through us. But the the simple principle I'm just trying to get across is, is that as we go with the gospel, we need to meet people's practical needs. And we need to pray for deliverance in their lives. Because that, oftentimes, is one of the most powerful things that they will see and will have an impact on their community. So, uh, heal those who are ill. And then notice what they were to say. The kingdom of God has come near to you. They were to give gospel truth with a sense of urgency. They were to say, Jesus is coming. You need to believe on him. And in a very real sense, that's what we're called to do as believers in 2022. Now, Jesus is not coming to, uh, as far as I know, to preach at Enniscorthy Christian Fellowship next week, okay? Like the 72 we're announcing, okay? Jesus is coming to your town, you know? That's not what we're called to announce. But he is coming, isn't he? He's coming back. And we are called to say, believe on Jesus. Uh, Believe on Jesus and trust what he has done on the cross. And so... Uh, they were called to do that. And notice then what they said, what it says in verse 10 through 12. It says, But when you enter into a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near you. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Those are sobering words to me. And kind of ominous. And really the idea was, as they went to towns, these 72 uh, witnesses, and they preached the good news about Jesus, if a town just rejected them and said, out you go, uh, they were literally uh, to wipe the dust off their feet. And the idea simply was, um, it seems kind of strange to us uh, in Ireland in 2022, but it was actually more familiar uh, to those in Eastern culture. And the idea was that you were saying, I am just, we are separating from you. We've come, we've given you the gospel. You have sent us away and we have done all that we can for you. The kingdom of God has come near you, but we're going on to the next town. That was the idea. Um, And it's amazing to me in verse 12, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Sodom, of course, was a very wicked town. We see in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. And God indeed had to judge that town. It's a very sad story. But can you imagine? Jesus was saying to these 72, as you go 
and you heal people and you cast out demons and you proclaim the kingdom of God, if people reject, I will personally hold them accountable for that at the judgment seat. You know, that is what Jesus was saying. He's saying that, and, uh, you know, I will hold them accountable for that rejection. Now, what do, what do we do with this passage? Hopefully that gives you a little better working understanding uh, of it. I, one interesting feature that came out in this study was the whole idea that they were to go without provisions because uh, the people, t- the households and the towns that would take care of them was a pic- would show that they were welcoming the gospel, that they wanted to hear more, okay, and that they were ready for Jesus himself to come. But hopefully that all of what I've shared that gives you a little better working understanding of it. So what do we do with it? Notice verse 2. Verse 2, I've already explained this a little bit, so I, I won't endeavor to repeat myself, but th- there's a dilemma here that I believe applies to all ages, that there's a harvest and yet there's not enough workers. And let me define a worker. A worker is not... Um, you know, a a certain select group of Christians. Any person who's a believer in Jesus and who is following Jesus is a worker in God's harvest field. Okay? I truly believe that. We all have different roles in the body of Christ. But if we know that we are forgiven and we are following Jesus, Jesus wants to use our lives to help those that would respond to the gospel if somebody would share it with them. With them. He wants to use us in their lives. Okay? And there's a need for workers today. There's a need for believers who will do that, who will share the good news about Jesus. And so, this, really, the solution to that problem is, of course, like the 72, to be available to God, but it's to pray to the Lord of the harvest. And as I look in the book of Acts, It seems that the Lord of the harvest in our age is the Holy Spirit himself. He is the one who's orchestrating the movement of the kingdom of God and the the expansion of the gospel and the church in our age. And we need to cry out to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, will you send out laborers into your harvest? You know, we feel the need where we are, don't we? But there's a need across this world for workers, for those uh, who... Uh, will follow Jesus with all their heart and will communicate the good news. And we need to pray. You know, it's something that challenges me again and again. We can make all sorts of plans. You know, we can have all sorts of outreaches and do all sorts of things. But what we need more than anything else is prayer. We need to cry out to God um, to enable us to reap the harvest around us. And that a big part of that is Him just sending out workers uh, into his harvest field. And so we need to pray. I would challenge you, pray regularly that God would send out laborers into the harvest. Don't pray for the harvest, okay? We can get all discouraged about the harvest sometimes. Nobody wants to hear the gospel. There's always some people who are open. And again, it may take some meeting some practical needs in their lives. It may take some praying for them and seeing God do some deliverance in their lives that shows them He is real. It may take some sharing the gospel multiple times and maybe different people interacting with them. But there are always people out there who are open. The need is for workers, for people who will share the gospel. The ESV translated, pray earnestly. I love that. Pray earnestly. And we should specifically ask the Lord for that. Now notice in verse 3, I already talked a little bit about this. uh, But there in verse 3, Jesus said, He sent them out as lambs among wolves. And we think of how weak, how vulnerable, how defenseless a lamb is. Uh, Really, if you were to put a lamb into a pack of wolves, um, the little lamb wouldn't stand a chance, would it? You know, those hungry wolves would make short work of that little lamb, okay? Um, and think about this for a second. Humanly speaking, the mission of the 72 was impossible. Okay? They were going out uh, to share a message that was radical in their day. 
and they were going out to give this message. They, they didn't have, they weren't going with any resources. You know, they didn't have, you know, a big um, bank account. They didn't have extra belongings. They didn't have a big support network that was going to make sure they had what they need. They had nothing. They were like lambs going out into a pack of wolves. And humanly speaking, it was impossible. But when they added an all-powerful God to the equation, it became mission possible. And let's remember that. As we witness for Christ, humanly speaking, it's impossible. You know, the prospect of trying to give the good news about Jesus to a postmodern Western society in 2022, it's absurd, humanly speaking. But yet we know people all around us are coming to Christ every day in this country. People are coming to Christ. Why? Because God's at work. Because, you know, it's the Holy Spirit's harvest. It's not our harvest. He is the one in charge. He is the one at work. And if we will just pray to God, Lord, send out labors, and we'll just be willing to be workers ourselves, God can use us in the lives of people. It's amazing to me that in a sense, Jesus has on purpose put us at a disadvantage. You know, we're telling people about a God they can't see. Who sent His Son, Jesus, who many question is even God. We know He's God. But many people would say, is He even God? You know? And we're bringing the message of His Son who came and died on a cross. What in the world? You know? To the Western mind, that's crazy. And He can forgive us and Again, the God we cannot see, we can have a relationship with Him in this life, and someday we can go to be with Him in heaven, a place, again, we cannot see or prove the existence of. Okay? But yet, with the power of God, many people hear that message and they say, it's true. They, the Holy Spirit bears witness in their heart and they say, that's true. That's what I need. That's what happened to each of us, right? You know, there was a moment... Um, where we maybe turn from our wrong thinking and we came to Christ and we put our faith in Jesus. And that is for all of us. And so let's remember, we are sent out, just as the 72, like lambs among wolves. But with God as a part of the equation, God can do amazing things. He can protect us and He can use us to be a help to people. Something that really struck me from this passage um, as I studied it, we need to prioritize those who are open. Those who show signs of willingness to welcome the gospel of peace into their lives. Okay, You know, we talk to all sorts of people and we share the good news with them. Um, And sometimes it can be discouraging to us when people are not open. You know, they're not ready. Now, one thing I've seen over the years is sometimes you share the good news with someone and they're not open at that time. But God is at work in their life, utterly apart from anything we do. And years later, you might find that person is now open. They're ready, okay? But we do need to ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom to help us to prioritize those who are open. Again, you know... um, the 72 were not to stand outside the town and, you know, throw stones at them, you know. Why did you reject us? They were to say, okay, I understand that you don't want to hear it. We are going to the next town to see if maybe they will be uh, more welcoming uh, to the message. And so, uh, we need to prioritize uh, those who are open. And uh, when we share the gospel with somebody and they don't receive it, don't become discouraged. Don't become discouraged recognize that perhaps there's somebody else that I need to speak to, okay? Um, and again, we, we, we really do need wisdom from God in that, okay? Because sometimes we share the good news with somebody and they don't seem particularly open, but they need more care, right? They need more ministry from us, okay? And it's not just, oh, you heard it one time, the end. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am talking about when we look at the people around us and we see signs of openness, we need to make sure to be good stewards of those people who are open. And we need to ask God, give me wisdom. Who should I be investing um, that time in? And now I want to just close with this simple thought. You know, the, the last few verses of this passage are quite ominous. 
Okay? In that um, Jesus is telling these 72 that if you go into a town and they don't welcome the message, they don't welcome you as my messengers, you are literally to wipe the dust off your feet and I will hold them accountable for that someday. Now think about that. These are just people like you and me. These are, they weren't even the 12 apostles, okay? These are just ordinary followers of Jesus that Jesus appointed and he sent out to heal people, to give the good news, to prepare the way for him to come to those towns, okay? And yet, Jesus said, if they reject you, they will be in trouble with God. You know, I think it's, it's sometimes we can be tempted as we, as Christians in our world, to kind of feel like we're this little marginalized minority and we believe some strange things. You ever felt like that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Thank you for that honesty. Because I do. You know? I feel like that sometimes. But you know what? I love that song we sang today about how Jesus is so great. You know? And um, it, it just moved my heart. Friends, we are sent by King Jesus to speak to people about him. This is not just some crazy idea we cooked up. You know, Jesus is going to rule over this whole world someday. Jesus is, is going to come back and everyone will have to bow the knee and say he is Lord. And it's that same Jesus that sent us with the gospel of peace, as Ephesians chapter 6 put, puts it. The good news of peace. And you know what? We need to sometimes cop ourselves on and recognize we are not this marginalized little minority. We are so privileged and blessed to know Jesus personally and then to get to be his messengers. Now, it's not always easy. And sometimes people do react to us. But the reality is it's a great honor. It's a great privilege. And, you know, we get to say to people, you know, if a believer has shared the good news with you, the kingdom of God has come near you, you know. God has reached out to you through imperfect human beings to try to give you the message of the gospel. And I think that gives us cause to hold our head up and say, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. And I'm not going to let anyone shut me up, you know. I'm going to speak for Jesus because he is the one who sent me. It was his idea. And, you know, may God use those simple and maybe a bit rambling thoughts, okay, I'll admit this, uh, but to challenge us um, as we are workers for Jesus, to challenge us to pray for more workers because there is a harvest around us.